During this last decade, the interest in professional fasting has markedly diminished. It used to pay very well to stage such great performances under one's own management. But today, that is quite impossible. We live in a different world now. At one time, the whole town took a lively interest in the fasting showman. From day to day of his fast, the excitement mounted. Everybody wanted to see him at least once a day. There were people who bought season tickets for the last few days and sat from morning till night in front of his small bird cage. Even in the night time, there were visiting hours when the whole effect was heightened by torch flares. Children stood open-mouthed, holding each other's hands for greater security, marveling at him as he sat there, pallid in black tights, with his ribs sticking out so prominently, not even on a seat, but down a man's straw on the ground sometimes giving a cater's nod, answering questions with a constrained smile, or perhaps stretching an arm through the bars so that one might feel how thin it was, and then again withdrawing deep into himself. Besides casual on Lucas, there were also relays of permanent watchers selected by the public, usually poachers, strangely enough. And it was their task to watch the fasting show men day and night, three of them at a time, in case he should have some secret recourse to nourishment. This was nothing but a formality instituted to reassure the masses for the initiate knew well enough that during his fast, the artist would never in any circumstances, not even under a forcible compulsion, swallow a smallest morsel of food. The honor of his profession forbade it. <laughs> No one could possibly watch the fasting showman continuously day and night. And so, no one could produce first-hand evidence that the fast had really been rigorous and continuous. Only the artist himself could know that. He was therefore bound to be a so completely satisfied spectator of his own fast. Yet for other reasons, he was never satisfied. It was not perhaps mere fasting that had brought him to such skeleton thinness that many people had regretfully to keep away from his exhibitions because the sight of him was too much for them. It was perhaps dissatisfaction with himself that had worn him down, for he alone knew what no other initiates knew how easy it was to fast. It was the easiest thing in the world. He made no secret of this, yet people did not believe. The longest time he could fast was fixed by his impresario at 40 days. Beyond that term, he was not allowed to go, not even in great cities, and there was good reason for it to. Experience had proved that for about 40 days, the interest of the public could be stimulated by steady pressure of advertisement, but after that, the town began to lose interest. Sympathetic support began notably to fall off. So on 
the fortieth day, the flower pediatric cage was opened. Enthusiastic spectators filled the hall, a military band played. Two doctors entered the cage to measure the result of the fast, which were announced through a megaphone. And finally, two young ladies appeared. Blissful at having been selected for the honor to help the fasting show men down the few steps leading to a small table on which was spread a carefully chosen invalid repast. And at this very moment, the artist always turned stubborn. His public pretended to admire him so much. Why should it have so little patience with him? If he could enjoy fasting longer, why shouldn't the public enjoy it? Besides, he was tired. He was comfortable sitting in the straw, and now he was supposed to lift himself to his full height and go down to a meal, the very thought of which gave him a nausea, that only the presence of the ladies kept him from betraying, even that with an effort. And he looked up into the eyes of the ladies, who were apparently so friendly and in reality so cruel and shook his head, which felt too heavy on its strandless neck. But then there happened yet again what always happened. The impresario came forward without a word, for the band made speech impossible, lifted his arms in the air above the artist, as if inviting heaven to look down upon his creature here in the straw, this suffering martyr, which indeed he was. Although in quite another sense, grasping round the imitated waist with exaggerated caution, so that the frail condition he was in might be appreciated and committed him to the care of blanching ladies, not without secretly giving him a shaking so that his legs and body tortured and swayed. And he lived for many years with small regular intervals of recuperation, honored by the world, yet in spite of that, troubled in spirit. And all the more trouble because no one would take his trouble seriously. What comfort could he possibly need? What more could he possibly wish for? A few years later, when the witnesses of such scenes called them to mind, they often failed to understand themselves at all. For a meanwhile, the aforementioned change in public interest had set in. It seemed to happen almost overnight. There may have been profound causes for it, but who was going to bother about that? At any rate, the pampered fasting showman suddenly found himself deserted one fine day by the amusement seekers who went streaming past him to other more favored attractions. For the last time, the impresario hurried him over half Europe to discover whether the old interest might still survive here and there, all in vain, everywhere, as if by secret agreement. A positive reversion from professional fasting was in evidence. Of course, it could have not really sprung up so suddenly as all that, and many premonitory symptoms which had not been sufficiently remarked or suppressed during the rush and glitter of success now came retrospectively to mind. But it was now too late to take any countermeasures. 
Fasting will surely come into fashion again at some future date. Yet that was no comfort for those living at the present. What then was the fasting show man to do? He had been applauded by thousands in his time and could hardly come down and showing himself in the street booth at village fairs. And as for adopting another profession, he was not only too old for that, but too fanatically devoted to fasting. So he took leave of the impresario his partner in an unparalleled career, and hired himself into the large circus. In order to spare his own feelings, he avoided reading the conditions of his contract. A large circus with its enormous traffic in replacing and recruiting men, animals, and apparatus can always find a use for people at any time, even for a fasting showman, provided, of course, that he does not ask too much. Large and gaily painted placards made a frame for the cage and announced what was to be seen inside it. When the public came thronging out in the intervals to see the animals, they could hardly avoid passing the fasting showman's cage and stopping there for a moment. Perhaps they might even stay longer had not those pressing behind them in the narrow gangway who did not understand why they should be held up on their way towards the excitement of the manager made it impossible for anyone to stand gazing quiet for any length of time. At first, he could hardly wait for the intervals. It was exhilarating to watch the crowds come streaming his way until only too soon. Not even the most obstinate self-deception clung to almost consciously could hold out against the fact the conviction was born in upon him that these people most of them to judge from their actions again and again, without exception, were all on their way to the menagerie. Perhaps, said the fasting showman to himself many a times, things would be little better if his cage were set not quite so near the menagerie. That made it too easy for people to make their choice to say nothing of what he suffered from the stench of the menagerie, the animal's restlessness by night, the carrying past of raw lambs of, of flesh for the beast of prey, the roaring at feeding times, which depressed him continually. The fine placards grew dirty and illegible. They were torn down, the little notice board telling the number of fast days achieved, which at first was changed carefully every day, had long stayed at the same figure, for even the, after the few weeks, this small task seemed pointless to the staff. And when once in a time, some leisurely passerby stopped and made merry over the old figure on the board, and spoke of swindling that was in its way the stupidest lie ever invented by indifference and inborn malice. Since it was not the fasting showman who was cheating, he was working honestly. But the world was cheating him of his reward. More days went by. However, that too came to an end. An overseer's eye fell on the cage one day, and he asked the attendants why this perfectly good cage should be left there standing unused with dirty straw inside it. Nobody knew, 
until one man helped out by the notice board. Remembered about the fasting show man. I always wanted you to admire my fasting. Said the fasting show man. We do admire it, said the overseer affably. But you shouldn't admire it, said the fasting show man. Well, we don't admire it, said the overseer. But why shouldn't we admire it? Because I have to fast. I can't do anything else, said the fasting show man. What a fellow you are, oh, said the overseer. But why can't you do anything else? Because, said the fasting show man, lifting his head a little and speaking with his lips pressed as if for a kiss right into the overseer's ear so that no syllable might be lost. Because, I couldn't find any food I liked. If I had found any, I should have made no bones of, about it and stuffed myself like you or anyone else. They buried the fasting show man, straw and all. Into the cage, they put a young panther even the most insensitive felt it refreshing to see this wild creature leaping around the cage that had so long been dreary. The panther was all right. The food he liked was brought him without hesitation by the attendants. He seemed not even to miss his freedom. His noble body finished almost to bursting point with all that it needed. It seemed to carry freedom around with it too. Somewhere in his jaws, it seemed to lack. And the joy of life streamed with such a damned passion from his throat that for the onlookers, it was not easy to stand the shock of it. But they braced themselves crowded around the cage and did not want ever to move away. Yeah. <laughs>